mysteries. And now when I read my text again, it may make a little bit more sense to you, but we speak the wisdom of God. We do speak the wisdom of God. In this church, we speak the wisdom of God. We speak it in a mystery. Even the hidden, everyone said hidden, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now it may surprise you how many times in the New Testament the word mystery is used in the same context as, as, as our text is. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 9, you will see the Apostle Paul there writes and he says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we're talking here, when I talk about the mystery of all mysteries, we're talking about a mystery that is from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. This thing's big, this thing's old, this thing is from uh, before there was even a world, and it's hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. While your Bible is still open and you're excited about reading it, look at Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, and verse number 11, and Jesus is talking and he is teaching, and he said unto them, Mark 4 11, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them, that's people that's not you, that are without, all these things are done in parables, and they don't understand them. Let me see if we can just find one more scripture real quick here in the book of Romans chapter 16 and verse number 25, which says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept. This is a remarkable scripture. The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. I'm talking about the mystery of all mysteries. And in the next verse it says, but is now made manifest. And Paul will tell you in other places that this mystery that was kept a secret from before the world began, that was a secret, it was kept until <coughs> Paul got the revelation of what that mystery was. So how far back is it before the world began? Well, it's a long time ago. That's all I can say. But this mystery has been kept all of that time. I'm talking about the mystery of all mysteries. And so when you look at this uh, in the church, the, you know, the word mystery means a truth heretofore unrevealed, but is now being revealed. A mystery is something that heretofore has not been revealed, but is now being revealed. Now it may have parts of it that remain abstract or ambiguous or not totally revealed, but it has a portion of it that is that with great clarity it is revealed. And so Paul here is talking about, and we've already read, and we could read more if we want to take the time to do it, but I've already read four or five scriptures to you which articulates this mystery that Paul is talking about. And I will read one or two more before we get through about that. So when you look at what this mystery is, the mystery is the revelation of what the church is in the earth. 
It is the coming of the church. It is a mystery. If you read your Bible carefully, you will know that the Old Testament prophets did not see the church age. Now let me just give you a little bit here that may help you. The Old Testament prophets actually prophesied things that have come to pass in the church age and are coming to pass in the church age, but they did not see the church age because they were prophesying them. They were prophesying things that were going to come to the nation of Israel. But when Israel, they were the ones that were chosen to be the people of God. They were the ones from which the Messiah came and to which the Messiah came. And when Jesus sat on the hillside at the end of his ministry above Jerusalem and wept and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. And now your house is left unto you desolate. At that point of time, when that prediction was made, it was made only about 37 years before 70 AD, when the Roman Empire came in and totally decimated the city of Jerusalem and totally subjugated the Jewish nation. And so Jesus was predicting that desolation. That desolation has remained upon Israel spiritually. Spiritually it has remained upon Israel unto this day. During that parenthesis of time that there has been Romans 11:25. Blindness in part that has happened to Israel. During that time, God has established the church. The Old Testament prophets did not see that parenthesis. They see that Israel was to be restored at some time in the future, which is predicted in Scripture, but they didn't see this period of time. And they could never get in their minds completely clear. Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it that they, the Old Testament prophets desired to look into the things of the church age, but they didn't see the church age. They saw things that are now happening in the church age that were prophesied to Israel. What they didn't see is that Israel, that the church, the Gentiles, is receiving the promises of Israel because they come by faith and that we are the children of Abraham by faith. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7 tells us that we are the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3 and chapter 14 tells us uh, that we have received the promises of Abraham in the Holy Ghost. When we received uh, the Holy Ghost, we have received the promises of Abraham. Galatians 3.29 tells us that we are the children of Abraham. And so we've received these promises. We're not natural Israel. But we received the spiritual promises that was promised to Israel, and we received them as Gentiles. And nobody, no prophet in the Old Testament, and nobody in the Old Testament ever saw a time when Gentiles would come to God without going through the Jewish nation. No one ever saw that. And yet the church is the only place in the history of the world where Gentiles are coming to God without coming and having to go through the Jewish nation. And that's because the Bible says in Acts 15 and 14, uh, when the church was having their first general council to figure out what was happening, because the first people that were saved were Jews, they didn't get it that these Gentiles were all coming in, but they saw them coming in. They were the ones preaching, and these Gentiles were finding God and getting the Holy Ghost. And so in Acts 15, they had a conference, a big uh, powwow to try to decide what to do about it. And in that conference, they decided, they found scripture in the Old Testament that predicted that there would be a period of time when God would take out of the Gentiles a people for his name's sake. This is the mystery of all mysteries uh, that was predicted before the world was formed that God would take the church out, which lets us know the church is not an afterthought just because Israel failed, but that God in his foreknowledge saw all of this uh, and the church will forever play a particular role, not only in this world, but in the world to come. And so in this context, he says, what, know you not that you shall judge angels? And think of what you think as of the most uh, 
the most simple saint in this church. Don't point at him. Because if you do that, you may find somebody pointing at you. But think of the most simple saint in the church that you can imagine. And the Bible says, Know ye not that ye shall judge angels. And when some of us can't even judge our own credit card. And so this is all going to happen. And we are in this. That God would choose us is amazing. But all of us are in this. And so we're expected to grow in grace. That we can become everything that he wants us to come. But we are in this hidden mystery of all mysteries. Which is the coming of the church into being. And that's why it is no small thing to have repented of your sins. It is not something that's secondary that you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that you belong to Him. There is a reason why we are very specific about baptism in this church, that we don't just baptize loosely and casually in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we take time to study the Word and discover what the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is. Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father. Father's not a name. I'm a father, but if I sign a check, I can't just write Father on it. And so I have to be baptized in the name of the Father. And Jesus said in John 5, 43, I come in my Father's name. Amen. Amen. And in the name of the Son, you can't just have someone baptize you. I mean, if you want to gamble on that, you can. But they didn't gamble on it in the Bible. And say, well, I'm going to be baptized in the name of the Son. Well, you've got to know what the name of the Son is. You've got to know what the name of the one is that died for you. That's the one whose name you're getting baptized in. We are buried with Him in baptism, not with them. We're buried, we're buried with Him in baptism. Romans chapter 4, uh, chapter 6 and verse 4 says... And so, and so the name of the Son is, you should call Matthew 121, you should call his name Jesus. Everybody said amen. amen. And then he said in John 14, 26, that he said, I will send the comforter back in my name. The Father will send the comforter back in my name. So whatever you think about the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, let me tell you, none of that has anything to do with what I'm talking about. And that is, if you obey the Bible, you're going to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And there's good reason to be specific and clear about that. Because he's the one that died for us. And when, you're, when his name's called over you, that means he owns you. That's a legal document. That means he owns you. So I'm not taking no chances with that. I'm going to be buried with the one that's died for me. As anybody else I'm buried with, they're not rising again. But I'm going to get buried in the name of the one that's rising again. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And, so, um, and so the church was a mystery. When you look in scripture, uh, quickly just turn with me. Being as we're actually using our Bibles tonight amazing and novel thing that we're doing here. Um, if you turn over to Matthew chapter 13, and here, let me, while you're turning to it, let me just explain what's in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is seven uh, metaphors or similes for the kingdom of God. Jesus had a method of teaching, his method of teaching was to go from the known to the unknown. That's one of the most basic lessons of how to teach people is you take them from the known to the unknown. The kingdom of heaven is light. Boom. And then it's like something that they know about. And then they can equate that with the abstract thing that you're trying to tell them about. This is what Jesus did. Look just briefly with me in Matthew chapter 13. And... Um, Verse number three, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell, okay? And then he gives where those seeds came up. But the point is, for you that have never heard this before, and there are some of you who have not, uh, uh, although some of you have, the point is, is that the seed the kingdom of heaven was like something that was buried. 
It's like something literally underground. Okay? Look at the next parable. Go down to verse 25. All of this is in chapter 13 of Matthew. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. That's the second one that he said the kingdom is like. It's like tares being sowed. But the tares and the good seed are both sown underground. Thank you. Amen. And so uh, then look at verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. A grain of mustard seed that was sowed underground. Thank you for helping me. Okay? Amen. You and I are having a good lesson here tonight. Amen. Okay, look at verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took. Now those others were men sowing, but here's a woman that took and hid three measures of, uh, hid leaven in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. And so you've got leaven, but it is hid in three measures of meal. And it makes the bread puff up and rise. And people say, behold, the magic that the bread is rising. But the woman knows it's not magic. She knows what was hid in the three measures of meal. And then if you look at number 41, the son of man, here's another parable, shall send forth his angels. Nah, nah. Look at verse 44. Uh, we didn't say anything about verse 41. Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field. Okay? So the treasure is hid in the field. Ah, are you getting a pattern here? If you're not, you need to be checked. All right? Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who, when he had found one. Where do pearls come from? They don't come from jewelry stores. Pearls come from oysters, and the, the, the pearl is hidden inside of the oyster, and uh, the oyster is hidden under the water, deep in the ocean, and so it's all a hidden thing. Oh man, if I was preaching about the pearl tonight, you know how a pearl is made? A pearl is made is because a grain of sand gets in the shell of the oyster and it irritates the oyster. And so the oyster puts a little, creates a little film to put around the grain of sand because it's hurting, it's, it's scratching against his kidney. I don't even know if they have kidneys, but anyway, you that eat them raw, eat those kidneys. But anyway, then, and, and then, and then, and then to make it feel better that the pearl will, the, 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 the oyster will put another little film over it and another film, another film, another film. This is where you get that translucent 3D look of a pearl is that there's all these layers that have been put over it, but pearls are created out of trouble. So quit driving when you have trouble. Just say, God's making a goodly pearl out of me. That is not my lesson, but that is for the several of you that needed to be awakened. Okay? And then if you look in verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea. And so it's fishing. And, and so it goes down. It can't see everything down there. It didn't have sonar and all that. And, 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 and it's cast into the sea. So all of it has to do with stuff that is beneath the surface. You need to understand that. Uh, when you understand that, you will, you will understand why, as great as our pastor is, the world is not knocking down his door as a rock star. Yet what he's doing is much more important than what happens downtown at Golden 2 or whatever it is. I'm not even sure that I'm even, I don't even know if it's called Golden, but anyway. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason that people that are preaching the gospel are not in the headlines every day as, uh, on, you know, on some reality show or something. There's a reason for all that. And the reason, did you know in ancient history, you can't hardly find Jesus mentioned 
in the history of his day, very only once or twice or so, maybe three or four times, can you find Jesus mentioned except in the Bible. I'm talking about secular history. And Jesus transformed the entire world, transformed the whole universe, transformed it all. But secular history, mm -mm, it's underground. It's hidden. And you can, I mean, I, I, there may be some kind of secular notice of the Apostle Paul, but I don't know of it. Uh, there may be some secular historical record, but I don't know of it. It's so obscure that I don't know anything about it. And if it wasn't obscure, I wouldn't know about it. And so uh, the Apostle Paul, what, like, transformed the known world while he was here on earth and while he was preaching and established churches everywhere and turned cities upside down. And the other apostles, likewise, but you hardly ever hear him even mentioned. And in secular history, it's like the whole of secular history in the Roman Empire and all of these great echelons went by and, and, and they didn't even make a blip on it. But they did. The blip they made is underneath. It's working in the hearts of men. It's not working through the political system primarily. It, by the, 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 the power that the church has on a political system is a byproduct of the power in the church. It's not the primary focus of the church. The primary focus of the church is not fighting social causes because to fight social causes as your primary element uh, is to fight uh, is to fight the manifestation of something rather than the cause of the something. All the stuff we have going on in our world today socially was going on, and even worse in some cases, back in the days of Jesus. And yet he did not stop to get involved in that because underneath that he was building something greater that was a mystery to people because it was underground. And that was building greater that it was going to have an impact that will be universal. That it someday it will explode into uh, not only uh, not only into being known, it will explode into its overt form of power, uh, and we will be a part of that. So, so you've got to understand that. That's why you're patient when you're going through it. That's why you're patient when things or when trials are on you. That's why you're faithful when you're tired. That's why you're, you're faithful when other people uh, 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 don't do you right. That's why you don't let yourself get so angry that you just say, I'm going to just run out and run. But where are you going to run to? There is nowhere to run to. So you have to suck it up and say, oh, no, there's a lot of things I may get mad and run from. But when it comes to the church, I'm going to be there. I'm in it. I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm a Jesus freak. I'm, I'm following Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And uh, I've told the story, but some of you weren't here. It's probably been a while since I told it. I don't know. Uh, you know, when you get old, you just retell stories to the people. They just tolerate it. So, uh, and so, you don't even know how long it's been since you told it. But uh, I, in 1988, I was in England. I've been back since then, but this was in 1988. I was in England. I was on a tour bus, and I asked the tour bus guy. I, he was pointing out all these things. And, and here's all the people. We'd already been to Westminster Abbey. We'd seen Oliver Wendell Holmes. We'd seen his grave. We'd seen Charles Darwin's grave. They're all buried in Westminster Abbey, which is the primary church building in England, which is a state church. And so it's across the street from Parliament. And uh, and and, uh, and it's all this. It's where the kings and, and queens of England are crowned and all the coronations, most of them, take place there and so forth. And so uh, when they were telling us about all of this, and so I asked the tour guide while I was on the bus with Sister Wilson and Brother and Sister Keys, and I said, uh, where, uh, where can we find the tomb of John Wesley? And this is true, this is not exaggeration, he ignored me. Now John Wesley is the greatest preacher in the history of England. John Wesley, I mean, he's been dead for 200 years, and the Methodist Church came out of John Wesley, or whatever it is now. But just to show you the impact the man had, not the right or wrong of the Methodist Church right now, but uh, the Methodist Church's annual budget in 2016 was over $600 million. Okay? He's been dead 200 years. 
and, and, and he would turn over to the grave if they saw some of the things going on, I'm sure, in many in Methodist churches. But I'm not throwing stones, I'm just explaining, okay? This is the way it is. And so, but John Wesley's impact in the world was like, was like enormous. And, and, and John Wesley came to America and swept through, and there was one year I read where John Wesley averaged preaching five times a day. Average preaching five times a day. How could he do that? And he would get on, he would preach in the morning, get on a horse, he'd go to another place 10 miles away, 50 miles. I mean, in those days, people couldn't go 15 miles every, you know, I mean, it took ever how long it took to go 15 miles. And 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 then, then he would preach there. Then he'd get on and go 20 miles and preach there. Then he'd get on and go 18 miles and preach there. Then he'd go five times a day. He averaged in America. And a great revival broke out in America. And, and incredible things happened. And Brother Brian Williams just got home from Harvard where he is a student. Uh, Harvard University. Harvard University was started in 1636. Harvard University had revivals sweep through it during the days of George Whitfield and John Wesley. They were revivals so great they shut Harvard down and had nothing but prayer meetings for two or three days at a time. The president of the university went into the chapel and tried to get all the students up and said, get up, we got to go to classes. And they ignored him and they just kept praying and seeking God, and worshiping God, and seeking and consecrating their life to God. This is, this is what was happening. And John Wesley was one of the things that fomented, one of the primary movers and shakers that fomented in America in those days. There were Methodists and Presbyterian camp meetings uh, and, uh, that had 10,000 people at a time. Uh, and the Holy Ghost would move across those camp meetings, uh, and it was, and, and the history books say it was like, it was like, it was like mowing down grain. The people would start a, a move of God would start on this side, and people would start falling and shouting and talking. They didn't know they were talking in tongues. They just said making unintelligible noises and falling, and it would for the whole the entire ten thousand people worshiping, and some of them staggering and. And, and that's where we get this little saying with, I'm actually quoting a history book when it says that women's long unkept, there are no women cut their hair in those days. They knew better than that, but that those, that their long uncut hair uh, would, that, uh, while they were shouting would pop, this is, this is a quote, would pop like a buggy whip in the wind. And, uh, and, and, and they, would be, they would be so lost in the Holy Ghost in these Presbyterian camp meetings. That's where all these state churches that you see in America today, this is their background. This is where they came from. And John Wesley was a primary mover and shaker in all of that in America, besides being a primary mover and shaker in England. But they wouldn't tell me where, his, where he was buried. The guy ignored me. I asked him again. They ignored me again. And the second time, it ticked him off. And he kind of looked at me and said, don't do that again. He didn't say it, but with his eyes, he said, don't do that again. I wanted to do it again. <laughs> but I thought, no, no. Just, you know, if he don't get it, he don't get it. And so when I was getting off the bus at the end of the day, he said, I went over there and he said, here's the address of where John West is buried. I said, thank you. You want to fight? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and so I said, thank you. Very kind. Very nice. And, and so the women went back to the hotel. It was almost dark. And Brother Keys and I got on the subway and made our way through the subway. It was like, God, we're going to get killed before we get out of this hole. And we went, we went a long ways. I don't know how far it was. It was a long ways. And when we got there, we got off, we walked down the street, we went to John Wesley's church, which was, as many of you know, I know you know, but I'm going to tell you again, which was exactly almost to the foot, one mile outside of the old wall of the city of London. And the reason it was is because in those days, in the Church of England, it may still be this way, I don't know, but in those days you couldn't have a church that was not a Church of England state church within one mile of the wall of the, of the capital city. And so John Wesley went 12 inches outside of one mile. I kind of like him. <laughs> that was that wall of the church, and then he built it. And so there was still time to get in. We went in, we walked in. The docent, the, it, was, it was 
a lot of people want to see it, I guess, so there was somebody there. A woman took us around and showed us these are the original benches that were here. She had one of the main pillars in the opening of the church. There was a little trap door at the bottom. She said, open that door. I opened it. She said, put your hand in there. I put my hand in there. And there was another pillar inside, the bigger pillar. She said, that pillar is the mast from the ship that brought him back and forth from America. And when he got home, he took the mast of that ship and made it the primary pillar that holds this, this building and this structure up. And so, yeah, we went through all that. And when she got all through, I said, well, where is he at? Where is he buried? I can't find him. She said, oh, he's out here in the backyard. So we walked out in the backyard, and there they had placed a modest monument over his tomb where he was buried. Because he couldn't be buried, they wouldn't let him be buried, not only in Westminster Abbey, they wouldn't let him be buried in the city. And so here's a man that's greater, I'm talking about the mystery that's hidden. That's greater than all of these politicians in the history of England. And yet, he is buried here. And that's when I walked across the street. It was almost dark. Uh, at that, it's, uh, we've been back since then, and they fixed this cemetery up. But there's a whole big cemetery there of people, I can't remember what they're called, but it's people that were that were dissenters from the Church of England that had had an experience with God and would not cave in to governmental repression. And, and in that, I, I walked in, it was just a little piece when I was there with the fence and the other was there, but it was it was hidden from us. And um, and when I was there, it was all weeds and little beat up fence, wire fence, and, and I walked in there and there was the tomb of his mother, a uh, little, little plaque, Susanna Wesley, who had nine children and who was the uh, progenitor of a great family. John and Charles were the best known of people that were, that were seekers after God. And, um, and uh, here was the uh, John Bunyan's tomb, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, just, just were kind of ragged out there in the grass, who was one of the greatest writers. There's never been a book in the history of the world that has sold more copies uh, of a book that built with progress other than the Bible and, and this man, but he wasn't good enough to be buried in there. So don't wait. Here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the message in this. Don't wait for the systems of this church to validate the rock church before you believe in its value. Don't wait for the systems of this world to validate the preachers and the saints. Don't wait for the systems of this world to validate your experience of the Holy Ghost and what it means to be filled with it and be baptized in the name of the Lord and to walk in righteousness. Don't wait. It's not going to take place. you got to know that it's the mystery. They don't understand it. But we understand it because we have it in our hearts. We can at least give a little hand clap of praise and celebration for what God has given to us. Amen. Amen. Let me give you one more scripture and then I'll let you go in Ephesians chapter 5. Notice in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning. At verse 22. 522. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now watch this. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, follow with me here. This is Ephesians 5.24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might, it's going to get heavier, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
Just, just keep all this in mind. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Where does he get this language? Look at verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. I'm preaching tonight about the mystery of all mysteries. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he's liking the husband and wife relationship to Jesus and a believer's relationship. Jesus and the church's relationship. Now look in Genesis chapter 2. This is where he gets this language. Genesis chapter 2 verse 21 through 24. And then I will be through. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs. And closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. What, what Paul quoted about Jesus and the church is taken directly out. He is quoting Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and his relationship with Eve. And so the church is likened to being the bride of Christ, bone of his bone, made of him, flesh of his flesh. Lord have mercy. There is a lot of stuff there. And it is done so in the same way that the woman was made from Adam out of his side. And so when they pierced the side of Jesus, blood and water run out. We are saved by the blood of Jesus and by washed by the water of the word and also baptized in his name. And so from his side comes the elements of salvation. Now here's the thing I want you to get. That this Old Testament scripture is the only type in the Bible that Paul could have used that preceded the fall. There is no other. This is so early in the Bible. Paul didn't say he, didn't, he could have taken other places where men got wives and used them for examples of Christ in the church. But he didn't. He goes back before the fall. And he uses the only example that could have been used in scripture to give what the church is like. The mystery of the church precedes the fall. The mystery of the church goes back. Our relationship with Jesus Christ has dimensions in it that you and I don't even know. That we do not experience with our five senses. Uh, that we don't conceive of because they penetrate through so many layers into what it means, the uniqueness and distinctiveness of being a human being that is born again and is the body of Christ, flesh of his flesh, and says it, bone of his bone, saved by his blood, baptized in his water. All of this is something that you and I are a part of. And so when I think of that, I think, man, I don't care who else backslides. Old Wilson's got to be sure that I keep my mind clear of what's going on here because this is the mystery of all mysteries and there's nothing else in the world that is like this. And the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. And I've got it in my heart tonight. I'm going to go home and rejoice about it. Stand with me. I'm going to shout about it. I'm going to celebrate it every chance I get. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus together right now. Lift your heart, lift your hands. Come on, let's magnify his name. Come on, we got the word. Let's water it with a little spirit here. Amen, 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 amen.
Praise God. So over here you've got Adam. Over here you've got Christ. Over here you've got Adam put into a deep sleep. Over here you have Christ's death. Death for a Christian is awesome. It is often likened to sleep. Eve is taken from Adam's side. The church is taken from Christ's side, symbolized by the water and the blood. The woman is made from the actual person of the man, from his rib. And the church is actually made from Christ and is identified as his body. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The church is the body of Christ. And then the Lord brought her unto man and presented her to Adam. And Christ is going to present the church to himself. He is, he is both God and man. And so he is going to present the church to himself. We read it tonight. Amen. And Adam says, Eve is flesh of my flesh. And Christ says, the church is flesh of my flesh. Hold on to that. God bless you. You're dismissed.